and gentlemen, please welcome <laughs> Mr. Wei Wang. So basically, I have done a lot of crap. <laughs> a lot of stuff, that's all. You know, if David Tran walked into a restaurant and he asked for a table for eight, if there's four David Trans, he asks us for a table for eight, why? <laughs> he puts his hat on the other seat. So four guys, four hats, eight seats. Anyways, the people come to my office to do trust matters, will matters. The question that really bugs them the most is, my kids, what happens? Basically about the money, how do I give money to my kids when I pass away, and about giving money to my kids while I am alive. There are two different equations. There are many different techniques, and I'm going to, let me see. There are three main methods of giving property to the kids, either alive or on passing. The first one is custodianship. I give this to this gentleman, and I ask him to be a custodian for my child for this object until my child is 18 years old. He has all the right to manage that and do anything he wants with that, but he has to give it to my kid at age 18. Very commonly, we do these things in our bank accounts, a custodianship account for our kid until age 18. Now, custodianships can go until age 21. And if you set it up while you're alive, maximum age is 21. Custodianships are really, really good because it's super, super flexible. There's no requirements of any sort. I set up custodianship, it's done deal. Another kind people do is while they're alive, they set up an irrevocable trust. And normally they'd use this for insurance purposes. My kids are two and three. I want to give them a bunch of money. And I kind of hope the trustee will buy life insurance on my life that will pay to the kids. And then it's going to be managed over a term of years. Why do I do this? because I have an estate tax problem. Let's say right now I have a four million, my wife has four million, and it's eight million. But the estate tax limit is 10.8 between the two of us. Well, I expect to live, so I probably will exceed that. But if I buy $4 million of life insurance, well, I'll be 12 million, right? So if I owned the insurance myself, that four million would be included in my estate. Now I am at 12 million. Four plus eight. But if I put that money into an irrevocable trust and I let the trustee buy the insurance, gee, I don't own that money, do I? I made a completed gift to my kids. The trustee used the money to buy the life insurance. I kicked the bucket. I don't own the four million. I don't get taxed on it. So that's a real, really good technique. So that all depends at what level you're at. So you have a lot of money, or you're going to get to that point, it's a good idea to do this. Children trust, same thing as irrevocable trust, but it typically is set up after mom and dad pass away. So mom says, uh, dad says, if I kick the bucket, I give it to my wife. My wife kicks the bucket, give it to me. And we've both gone, I want it to go into a child's trust. This child's trust will allow my kids to have money at all times for their health care, education, management, and their support. Or you can limit it more to wherever you want. Because so long as it's not illegal or immoral, you can do anything you want as far as when the kid will get it and what the kid will get the money for. A lot of parents will say, ah, you know, my kid's kind of young. I don't know what's going to happen. They're, 20, they're only two and three now. Will, will they be good in managing their money when they're 25 or 18? I wouldn't drop eight million bucks on an 18-year-old. <laughs> what are they gonna do? They're gonna buy a Ferrari or something. They're gonna blow it. Many parents will say they get that money for their health, care, education, maintenance, and support, always. But they won't get the principal 
until later time, perhaps one third at age 25 and they probably finished college, another third at 30 or at the last at 35. It, the, the ages are arbitrary, it's up to you. I have some parents come in and they go, you know what? I've been training my kids since they were little. I have no fear. I give it everything to them at age 18. No, I know those kids. They're good. Okay? These kids, this family, they're really good. These kids, they already, they already have their own businesses. They're 18 years old. They've been running for two years already. So in that instance, I can understand that. But in some instances, gee whiz, if the kids are normal kids, they're not going to know how to handle money. Period. Let's say the kid gets married, and you know you haven't kicked the bucket yet. And you go, you know what? I hate that boyfriend. And I think they might get divorced. So you change your trust. My daughter will get her money always for blah, 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 maintenance and support. But she doesn't get the principal until she gets to age 50. Well, she's always got the money. You know, she can use it, right? Why? If she gets the principal, what happens when she gets it and she starts commingling? Mm, not quite. But if she gets divorced, he has to litigate how to figure out how much was hers, how much was his. It's a real, real pain. I did one case several years ago. This guy was married for two years, divorced. Okay, he bought his house. Married for two years, divorced, and then got remarried. So he's only married for two years, all right? And he only had, had the house for four. Now, how much community property interest does she have in that house? Tell you the truth, I don't know. I wasn't the family law lawyer. I never did family law. Well, I did a couple, and I hated it. <laughs> yeah, you know, you get a husband and wife, they're fighting, they spend $150,000 on litigation, and you go, your kid's going to college. Why don't you just put the 50 over there? But no, no, no. I'm going to fight him. I'm going to fight him. Okay? I had a lady call me back and goes, uh, I want the car. I said, you got the apartment building. You got the house. You got the Mercedes Benz. And you got the other Mercedes Benz. Why do you want the Miata for? <laughs> I called him up. I called the guy. And the guy goes, give it to her. I don't care. Just take over the payments. And she goes, there's payments? I don't want it. <laughs> but... <laughs> You know the stories we go through as lawyers? If we actually published them, no one would believe them because it's really, they're sometimes really crazy. But anyways, let's say she got uh, this guy. I went to go look at the divorce file, and the thing was like eight inches thick. And lawyers, we kind of joke, you know, one inch is 10,000 bucks. And I'm thinking, hold it, how much equity is in this house? Maybe 50, 60,000, fighting like this. So if the money is in a trust for your child, child doesn't have possession of that money yet. Child gets divorced. The guy goes, or the girl, wherever it is, says, I want a piece of it. Nope, that is a gift from my parents to me. That is separate property. I never got it yet. I only received the income for health care, education, maintenance, and support. And I spend that every year, so there's nothing left. You can't touch the principal. That is such an easy piece of litigation. Boom, easy. The, the other spouse cannot get it. Uh, let, let's go to the next slide here. I guess I got to push it, huh? So when we give gifts to kids, these are many different reasons. I won't read them, but I'll talk about a few of them. I kind of mentioned about estate taxes. You give it away so it belongs to the kid, not you. And appreciation belongs to the kids. I'll tell you what we did in my family. My dad bought a 36-unit apartment house. So he put down the down payment for us. He loaned the money to us. Then we paid him back for the loan. So we own a third. So by the time that property went all the way up, and when he passed away, in those days, a state tax limit was 600000 Right now it's 5.4. So he would have got taxed out of his gourd. By moving 30% of that property to us, that part of the property was not part of his estate. Okay? Now, don't think it's free. We worked for it. Okay? When I was 16, I was already, well, when I was 12, I used to do all the additions on our receipts. 
By the time I was 16, I was helping my brother do the tax returns. By the time I got to college, of course, you know, I already knew about tax returns. And when I got to law school and I took tax class, I said, so? I knew half the stuff already, okay? So we worked for it, but that's another thing I'm gonna mention later. Asset protection. Let's say, for instance, you have properties and you go, gee whiz, I'm getting kind of older, uh, I'm not driving very well. Eh, I give my apartment building to my son. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> thank you, son. <laughs> and I drive down Third Street Promenade and I wipe out a bunch of people. They sue me, they get everything from me. They can't get my son's property. It belongs to him. I don't own it. And I did not give it away to avoid litigation. No one was suing me yet. But if I ran him over, then I gave it to him. Well, that's a different story. But I didn't run anyone over yet. I just gave it to him. I love my son. So I gave it to him. Okay. I talked about dissolution of marriage. Blended families. Husband and wife get together. He has three kids. She has three kids. The spouse says, gee whiz, if I kick the bucket, I want part of my property go to my my kids, and maybe some to your kids. So in blended families, we can set up gifts to children because of that. Um, teaching financial responsibility. That's the hardest thing to teach kids because they don't listen. <laughs> they kind of, I don't know. They said, it came out of Forbes, Newsweek, everything, Wall Street Journal about three years ago. It said it is chemical in their brain while they're teenagers. They can do calculus, geometry, you name it, chemistry. They can do all that. But when mom and dad says, one, two, three, therefore, they go, what? It's not fair. Go away, <laughs> right? So about teaching financial responsibility is a tool that parents do by making gifts to kids. Remember I talked about that life insurance? Every client that comes to me who sets up an irrevocable trust for the kids with life insurance in there. I try to make sure that the kids make some payment toward that life insurance when they get older. Yeah, kid can do anything he wants. He can put money in. So now it's not gonna happen for these little three-year-olds and four-year-olds, but if they're over 18, make them put in 100 bucks a month. 200 bucks, whatever it is. Because then they, when they get the money, they're gonna feel that the pain. They felt the pain for 10 years of paying for this thing. They didn't pay the whole premium. Premium was $10,000, but they paid 100 bucks. But at least they felt like they earned it. Because what's that uh, nice saying? Easy come, easy go. Now I've done this for 32 years. I've seen, okay, I have to admit it, some of, my, some of my clients do die, okay? And I've seen the kids blow it. And they blow it in sometimes the most stupid way possible. Okay? Try this one on for size. Sister is the trustee. Son is not the trustee. The only two kids. Now this mother, she only had like 800 grand. But you know, there's a lot of money still. They work really hard to save that. In the old days, it was really hard to have a few bucks. 1965, what's the average income? 6,500. So saving 80, 800 grand over these years, it's a lot of dough. It's 2009, what happened? Everything went to pots, right? The guy was a construction guy. So I asked him, How's business? Is there any problems? Did you lose your truck yet? Did you lose your DeWalt tools yet? Because everything went to pot, right? Remember Home Depot? Everyone had a brand new truck. Everyone had DeWalt tools. I mean, are you guys familiar with DeWalt tools? If you buy a drill for 20 bucks, DeWalt's 100. But everyone had DeWalt's. I mean, like, man, because they were having money coming out of their ears during that construction period. So I asked them, do you have any problems? No. I said, look, the trust says it goes to you, but it, if you don't want it, it goes to your two kids. 
who are adults, they're 24 and 25, and they're great kids, and you live together. No problem. I said, look, man, you're in construction. Don't give me this. No problem. I sent the sister out of the room. Ask him again. No problem. OK, so what do we do? She made the distributions. He paid off the bills, one half to her, one half to him. About eight months later, he comes back in and says, can you help me? I said, what? I got a $400,000 judgment against me. I said, when did this happen? Well, I was being sued, you know, a year ago. So why didn't you tell me? All you had to do was say, I don't want it. Under the trust, if a person doesn't want something, well, under any document, actually, because you can't force someone to take a gift. I want you to have this. He says, I don't want it. Can I make him take it? No. If he doesn't want it, the trust says, we, trust, we treat him as he's, he's gone. And the trust document happened to say it goes to his kids. Let's say he doesn't have a trust, no will, nothing. The law of the state of California says if he's gone, it goes to his kids. Bingo. All he had to say was, I don't want it. And what would happen? The kids would have a $400,000 house. He gets to live in it with his kids, and his creditors get zero. So people lose money in the strangest possible ways for all kinds of reasons. And that, that that's not even counting financial immaturity. That was just plain stupid. I hate to call him that, but that was, got to call an ace and ace and a spade to spade, right? So we have to always be careful when we give things to kids and how kids will be able to keep it. Let me see. Ah, I already talked about number seven. But that'll get me to another point. Um, I'm going to guess some of you guys got young kids and some got older kids. And I talked about a little bit about how I grew up, where I did a bunch of work. This is probably the best investment you could ever do, and it's never too late to start. Okay? Kids today are too busy going to SATs and activities and those type of things. But as parents, what is our goal? When we have to ask ourselves, what's my goal? Not to get in Harvard, but get into Harvard and come out with a good job. Not only that, but have a good life. It doesn't have to be Harvard. It could be Cal State LA. It doesn't matter. You could go to LA City College. I don't have a problem with that. I spent two years there. I hated it. But I spent two years there. Why? Because it was cheap. What was it, $6 or something? I don't know. Back in the old days, OK? So I went cheap, but then went to UCLA, then went to Loyola, blah, blah, blah. I went to Cal State LA also. But the point is, when the kids grow up working for it, they will respect it when they get it later. So there's no reason to work and build up a big chunk just to give it to them to blow. So what do you do? You got to give them the tools, how to manage this stuff while you're around so you can watch. If the kid will not learn, when you make your gifts to your kids, you can put it in a child's trust to be managed by someone else. OK? Let's say, for instance, you built up five apartment buildings. You got over 100 units, and they're pretty good. And they're going to generate income, and et cetera, et cetera. But the kids won't go check the buildings. They won't do anything. They just, hey, mom, I need to buy another handbag. Got $200 inside, and the bag costs $3,000. I mean, give me a thing. So you know, it's really funny. You ever go to these young kids' restaurants today? I mean, some of you got, okay, you're too, uh, your kids are too young. No, uh, I'm going to guess 11 and 13, right? Yeah, pretty good, huh? <laughs> no, she told me earlier, okay? You guys thought it was magic. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, let's say you got these apartment buildings, and you go, wow, well, gee whiz, my kids don't go there, they don't manage it, they don't do anything. So you know what? I kicked the bucket, this thing's a bunch of money, I will give it to Bank of the West, Union Bank, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. They have wealth management departments only for trusts. They don't co-mingle the money just to put it on their own banks. They must diversify for FDIC limits and all those kind of things. They can put money in banks anywhere in the country they want to get you the highest interest rates. And that's for the kids. 
and you can put it in there and put down what your rules are. My kids will always get money for the one, two, three, and four, but they're not going to get the principal to a certain time. Blah, blah, blah. You can put all of these control factors in that document, and you can release a little bit at a time. This way to preserve that wealth. Because the kids don't have that ability, and they may never get that ability. But some kids, of course, there are, a lot of kids are great, and they learn, and they learn to manage. But that usually is the best way to teach them is while you're around, and you're able to be there to make those choices and changes for them. Yeah, get them sit down. Help me do the tax return. They hate it, all right? I used to have an engine block in my garage. I didn't care about working on it. I just wanted my daughter to see me doing something with it. Just to ask a couple of things, like, what's that? You know, you had an inspirational quote this morning about thinking. But what is thinking? You must first have mental inventory. Without mental inventory, you can't think or you can think with only your limited mental authority, uh, knowledge. You ever go into a, a, a market and only look at the bottom shelf? Anyone try that? Next time go in, only look at the top shelf? Well, I did it and I was surprised. I said, I didn't know those things existed. I didn't know those things existed. I cannot design a landscape garden because I don't see very many. I don't know a name of one plant from another, but you guys do. You have that mental inventory. So thinking on that basis, you're experts. Inside of the house, you have got that mental inventory. Same thing with your kids. Help them build that mental inventory so they will be able to preserve the wealth that you pass down to them. Ah, the incredible power of appointment. Now this is a real nice one. You put in your document, just for my kids, et cetera, et cetera. But Uncle George, Uncle George has a power of appointment. He can appoint to anyone in that document the rest of the principal, including giving it to all the charity. So if he sees a kid grooving off and don't deserve it, he could do that. Just say, I exercise the power of appointment, and I transfer it to Someone said a school around here. UCLA, someone said this morning. Yes. USC. <laughs> They're all great schools. You know, there was a study came out a little while back, and it said for the average student, no matter what university you go to, the average student earns the same. No matter what university you go to. Well, of course, the cream of the crop, you know, that's different, right? but the average student will earn about the same. So that tells you a little bit about universities and what you want to achieve for the kids that need to get up to that special school. It's the kid, it's the mental inventory, it's the desire to learn and do things. And they can only get that when they have the ability and the inventory to do that. Thank you, that's all I got. <laughs>